So we're out for a walk in the woods. It's bluebell time, which is also St. George's mushroom time. So I'm hoping we might find some St. George's mushrooms today. Maybe, if we're really lucky, we might find some morels. Although I keep on coming out looking for morels and I've never yet been lucky. But, you know, today could be the day. Whatever happens, we're not going home empty-handed today foraging. I'm gonna find something we can forage and cook. Even if it ends up being nettles. I sh that sounds like I don't like nettles, doesn't it? So GoPro battery died, sorry about that. So the rest of it's gonna be perhaps not quite so steady video. But here's what I meant when I said we won't return empty-handed because there's some lovely wild garlic here, Ramsons. So even if we don't find mushrooms, I'm picking some of this wild garlic, but we're gonna have a scout around first and see what we can find. So yeah, nothing wrong with nettles, but I didn't bring any gloves today, so we won't be picking nettles, even though they do look fantastic. Look at that. This looks like an old chalk pit or something. You find these quite a lot in woodland areas in Dorset. And this is where historically somebody's dug a lot of chalk and clay out of the hillside here, probably to build a house, a cob house or something like that. So the chalk is used for is rammed earth walls, basically. Over there, that looked like a badger set. Down here, primroses growing on an old stump. How about that? The old bumblebee and the nettles there. Chiff chaff in the trees. Let's just listen to see if we hear it again. So, lots to enjoy. Here's something interesting. This is, I think, probably red currants. Definitely currants of some sort. It's not gooseberries because it's not spiky. So that could be red currants. Could be black currants, but more likely red currants down here in the south of England. Slightly out of breath, because we've just climbed up there. <laughs> Actually, I'll hold the camera level. There you go. That's the chalk pit down there that I spoke about just a minute ago. We've just climbed up a winding path up this hillside here. Quite the trek. This plant here is called Jack by the Hedges or Garlic Mustard. There's another one over there. Not actually related to garlic at all. It's a, it is a mustard family plant, but people say it has a garlicky sort of aroma. Not gonna pick that today because there's not a lot of it here. And these are raspberry canes. Definitely not brambles, there are no thorns on them. So this is the wood for, well we saw some more red currants down there, and raspberries. So we'll have to come back here at the right time, see if we can pick one or two wild raspberries. So this kind of mossy hillside of mixed trees, including some coniferous, but mixed deciduous mostly, is supposedly the sort of place where you would find morels but we're not finding any today. One thing with morels, you have to get your eye in, but also you just have to be in the right place. It has to be the right mix of trees and the morels have to be present, which it looks like maybe they're not, or maybe they are and I'm just not seeing them. So Jenny just spotted this. This is another currant bush, red currants. And look at all the flowers on there. All those flowers hopefully will be berries. So definitely got to come back here in what, June, I think. And we'll see if we can pick some red currants. There is, however, a ton of lovely ramsons. Not quite in flower yet in most places. This is the perfect time to pick it. I'm not going to pick it from here actually, but just to show you, this is what it needs to be. It's kind of squeaky. So lovely, fresh, full leaves not even gone over a little bit yet. So a peak of readiness for picking. So it looks like today's foraging dinner is going to include some wild garlic. Also to complete a trio of red berries, 
this foliage here is wild strawberries. I haven't seen any flowers yet, but that's very much dependent on how much light the plants get. So quite often they'll grow as kind of ground cover, spreading themselves around by little runners. And then when a tree falls down and it gets a bit more sunlight, they kind of burst into action and produce berries. The birds scatter the seeds, they spread to new areas. So wild strawberries. So we've had wild strawberries, red currants and raspberries today. No fruit yet, obviously, because it's too early in the year. Amazing view out across the valley here. But these trees look a bit sad, don't they? And there's a reason for that. These are ash trees and they are suffering with ash dieback. You can tell that tree in the middle there just should be a lot more twiggy and branchy than that. And it's it's not. It's died back to the main stem. The bark has taken on a sort of blackened look. And there's very few actual twigs for leaves to grow. It will probably produce leaves this year, but I imagine they're probably going to clear fell this area because the ash trees are all dying. There's a little cutting into the chalk hill here and you can see the underlying, that's the underlying rock. It's not really exactly bedrock, it's just chalk. Chalk filled with flints, but here there's probably been a water course of some sort and we've got some red clay you can tell it's clay just from the way it's all cracked up like that. So that's an iron rich clay in that little piece just there. To complete actually a quartet then of red fruits that will be available in early summer, a wild cherry tree and quite a few of them around here. Okay, so no mushrooms to speak of, but we've got this lovely wild garlic. So we can still have a meal with some forage elements in it. The reason I didn't pick this on camera is because we got this literally just as we were walking back to the car. And even then, it has started to wilt a little bit. So I'm going to give this a wash and get it in some water. So we'll just make sure that all of the stems are actually in the water here. And even though it's a little bit wilted now, that'll perk back up and it'll stay fresh until dinner time. Now, even though we didn't pick any mushrooms today, we can have wild mushrooms in the dinner this evening because... I've got my dried mushrooms that I saved from last year. So I will rehydrate some of these and we'll have a wild mushroom sauce with our chicken. So just about 400 ml of cold water and I will just shake in some of my lovely dried seps from last year. And then in this one here, we've got some other species of mushrooms. Quite a lot of mushrooms there, but might as well. I'll just get them under the water there. Okay, and I'll leave those to soak for a few hours. Time to cook something with this wild garlic, and you can see that's really perked up, hasn't it? Just from being sat in that water. We're gonna do wild garlic mashed potatoes. It's a kind of like Irish champ, but with wild garlic. And I'm gonna cook more mashed potatoes than I can possibly consume in one sitting. But there is a method in my mashed potato madness, so don't worry. These dried wild mushrooms are now completely hydrated, so we'll take them out. And most of the flavour from these mushrooms is now in that liquid. But nice enough mushrooms, so I'm not throwing them away. I'm just going to squeeze out any excess liquid out of them and reserve that lovely mushroom stock. So sometimes with dried mushrooms you can get a little bit of grit in the bottom of here, so I will decant this off to a different jug. In fact, it will probably be this jug here. This jug has got some chicken juices. I've got a, a few chicken legs here, which I've roasted in the oven. Most of what's coming off of here is juice. There is a little bit of fat on top. Those need about another, I think, probably 10, 15 minutes in the oven, and then we'll rest them. So there's actually, actually quite a lot of fat on the top of that, so I will separate that out. So to separate out this chicken fat, I'm just going to use the turkey baster again. We'll go right down to the bottom and get the chicken juices out. Okay, and most of what we got left there is just chicken fat. That I'm going to use to make my sauce. Chicken fat reserved in that little dish there. Chicken juices back into that jug, because also in that jug, I'm going to decant carefully my mushroom stock leaving behind the last little bit. I don't think there was any grit in there, but just leave that behind. 
There we go. So we've got almost a pint of lovely chicken and mushroom stock here. The mushrooms, I'll just run the knife through a few times just to cut them into smaller pieces. The sauce I'm gonna make is kind of a velouté, but instead of butter for the roux, we're gonna use that chicken fat with approximately an equal amount of plain flour, about probably a tablespoon and a half. Might not be quite enough fat in there, but fear not, I never throw chicken fat away. So in the fridge, I happen to have some more chicken fat from a roast chicken last week. Flour and fat, essentially a roux. It would normally be butter and flour, but chicken fat, since we're making a savory sauce, and we'll just let that sizzle a bit to cook the flour. Do you know what? I think we might go up another ring. That's better. So before it burns, in with most of my chicken and mushroom stock. Every about two thirds of it. So that's thickening up nicely. Now, that's gonna need a little pinch of salt in it. I'm just gonna put a bit more stock in there because it's looking a little bit on the thick side. It may take all of this stock actually, as it cooks. Right, little taste now. And just judge for thickness, that looks about right for a kind of, this is gonna be like a gravy basically. Wow, oh my gosh. That tastes so chicken and mushroom. Oh, it tastes really good. And then in with those pieces of mushroom. Now there is some liquid still in these mushrooms which will come out into the sauce and then thicken it back up if we need to. So I've got some carrots I've quartered and we'll steam those. And then I've just got these lovely spring greens here which I'll just cut out the mid ribs because they're a little bit tough. We could always steam those separately. And again, I'm gonna over cater on this cabbage because I have a cunning plan. In fact, I might well just use the whole thing. Right, so quick wash of all that lot. And then, I'll cut this into quite thin shreds. And just like that, just so we haven't got any really long bits. All of that's going to go in the top basket of the steamer. The carrots are already steaming to give them a little bit of a head start in the bottom basket. This won't take as long as carrots. Potatoes, getting close to done. Just another minute, I reckon. Which just gives me time to deal with this lovely wild garlic. So stems off. I will keep those, they're going to go in. This Ramsons wild garlic when you chop it up, it always smells like it's gonna be really powerful. But actually it's got quite a mild flavor. So we don't need to worry too much about using a lot of it. It really is more of a vegetable than a spice. The stems, I'm gonna cut up into tiny little pieces like that, that these stems when they're a bit older, they get a bit stringy and tough. But at this stage, we've got there. Right, well, it was lovely and fresh. Right, there we go. Potatoes drained. Sorry about the steam. Let's try that again. This cabbage is now going to go on because the carrots have come to the boil. Into those potatoes. What a bit of butter. But there's a lot of potatoes here, and I'm going to have some of my dairy fat in a different form in a moment. Chicken, looking nice and golden, out of the oven now, and we'll let that rest. Now, I like my mashed potatoes to have a little bit of lumps in them. So we're not gonna go for smooth and homogeneously creamy mash here today. I actually like a little bit of roughness in my mashed potatoes. You know, do your mashed potatoes the way you like your mashed potatoes. And if it's the way you like it, don't let anyone else tell you you're doing it wrong. That is as much as I want my potatoes mashed. So now in with all this wild garlic and the residual heat of the potatoes is gonna cook some of this a little bit. Instead of salt in here, I'm just gonna use a little bit of this stock powder, which obviously has salt in it, but it's also got some other flavors. And can you see how that wild garlic is starting to wilt down? Right, final ingredient, soured cream. 
and the whole lot is going to go in there because it's a big pan of mashed potatoes. All right, so we'll just work that cream in. And that's actually probably a little bit more creamy than I would normally have my mashed potatoes there, a little bit smoother and more soft than I would normally expect my mashed potatoes to be. All right, okay, tasting time. Let's have a little taste of that. Mm, it's good, and that wild garlic is really quite subtle. So nothing especially fancy here. We're just gonna have some of the garlic mashed potatoes, steamed spring greens, nice steamed carrots, skin on, because the skin seemed pretty nice and clean and unblemished. And then crispy chicken, and some of this lovely wild mushroom and chicken velouté. There we go. So that's a taste of foraging. Even though we didn't actually find wild mushrooms today, still got a taste of wild mushrooms. Just gonna do a quick taste test at the table. So I think probably all I really need to taste here is the sauce and the mashed potatoes, because we know what carrots and things taste like. But So mashed potatoes with wild garlic, with a chicken and wild mushroom velouté. Mm. Really good. Nice, nice, yeah. And the sauce with you like it? Yeah. The sauce with vegetables. Mm. Also really good. So that's as far as we'll go with the tasting for this one. But you might have noticed we've got a mountain of potato left. We've got some chicken left. We've got some cabbage left and some carrots. What are we going to do with that? So the story is not over. We've got three pieces of chicken left. So I'm just going to pick the chicken off the bones into these two dishes here. Anything that's not chicken meat is going to go in the stock pot. So the skin, well, apart from that really crispy bit there, but yeah, just this nice, lovely chicken. And any funny little stringy bits like that in that box. This is going to go in the freezer. This will be the stock box. So the bones and the, the not so nice bits of skin are all gonna go in there. That chicken is evenly divided by, between these two dishes. These dishes, when they're full up, will serve myself and Jenny for a main course. And then all the bones and stuff in this box, which will go in the freezer. This pan, there's a lot of flavor stuck to this pan. So I'm just gonna put a bit of water in there. Just cold water from the tap. I'm just gonna leave that to sit for a bit. Leftover from a meal earlier in the week. Some nice gammon ham, some nice roast gammon. Somebody will ask me what gammon is. It's bacon. But it's specifically bacon that's roasted as a whole joint. So we'll just cube that up. Share that out between these two dishes. Leftover carrots. So what we're gonna make here is a bit like a shepherd's pie, but with different meats. Some of this sauce left over, and there is a little bit of this chicken and mushroom stock, which I'll just stir in because the sauce has thickened up as it stood. And also when I freeze this, some of this sauce will soak into the chicken. You do want it to be a little bit thinner going into the dish here than it would be at the table. Okay, and then half of that on each of those. This was so nice, this sauce. I don't want to waste a drop of it. I'll just push that around, just make sure it's all the way through the dish. Yep, that looks about right. Leftover mash. I'll just scatter on the top in little chunks and then we can smooth it out so it's not too uneven. Okay, now because this is gonna go in the freezer, I am gonna smooth this top down. So there is the basis for two more main meals. So one of these with some more vegetables is enough for myself and Jenny for a, a not exactly heavy meal. And there is still some mashed potato left. 
And there's still some cabbage left as well. Can you guess what this is going to be made into? And then the pan from the chicken that's been soaking just in cold water. I'm going to loosen up all those little bits of crusty chicken drippings. And obviously if I didn't have the mushroom velouté thing with dinner, I could have done something like this with hot water and made gravy with these pan scrapings. Now all of this stuff on the pan here is essentially the same as the best chicken stock cube you can buy. Probably a bit better than the best chicken stock cube you can buy. Okay, I think we've got most of that. And then because I haven't got a use for this right now, I'm just going to tip that into the stock box that's going in the freezer. And I will just freeze that together with those bones. In fact, I realised I'd missed three little flowers of wild garlic, so those can just go in the stock box too. So the next day, I've got some sausages sizzling away over there. And we've got our leftovers. So mashed potato, wow. Now you can really smell the garlic when it's coming out of there. It's really weird stuff. It surprises me every time, this wild garlic, because it stinks the car out on the way home when you pick it and you have it in the boot of the car. And yet to eat, it's really quite mild flavoured. Anyway, just gonna mix up that cabbage and potato. So we're gonna make bubble and squeak. Quite a lot of cabbage in this bubble and squeak, but it'd be nicer for it. That's good. Just need to kind of come together so that it can hold together, because I'm gonna form it into little patties. Also gonna have some frozen peas in there. And they will cook from frozen. They only really need warming through. So they will cook from frozen in the time this takes to fry. Now, just because it's easy to clean, I'm gonna use my pastry mat for putting these on before I fry them. Take a handful like that. A lot of people just fry bubble and squeak directly in the pan in one big mass, and that's fine. I like it in little patties like that. So I like to be able to squeeze it together to form it into little cakes and then fry it like that. But, you know, as I keep saying, with every everything like this, you do what you want to do. Because it would be a really boring world if we all did things the same way. These peas are really cold. <laughs> well, and also the cabbage and potato obviously has been in the fridge overnight as well. There's not much fat coming out of these sausages, but I have a backup plan. I've still got some of that chicken fat. So we're going to use that. And how about that? They're just fit. Now I wanted to try and give these a chance to get a, a bit of a crust on one side before I try and flip them. Let's see what we've got. Not bad. All right, so that's bubbling squeak just about done. So I'm gonna get that out onto the warmed plates. Sausages are looking good as well. And then I'm just gonna have a couple of eggs. And that right there, not a bad little brunch, I think. Just gonna taste this bubble and squeak. Mm. Really good. Mm. Even better. So that's one of the pies. We're going to have that as a kind of midweek dinner. Now, I do actually get quite a lot of people ask me for more video content about normal cooking in the shrimp household. And this is kind of what you've been watching. This whole thing about creating leftovers, using leftovers, keeping little bits and pieces to make stock and so on. Adding in little bits of foraging as well, which is just not just food. It's about getting out and communing with nature is kind of the mode of operation when we can. Anyway, let's get this pie to the table. You can have a look at it. So there we go. This chicken and gammon and potato pie has been in the freezer waiting. There's another one as well, because we made two. I just took it out the day before yesterday just to let it thaw out. And we've got a delicious steaming hot dinner that took almost no effort to prepare. We'll just have that with 
some lovely salad. A bit of salad dressing and whatever else. Anyway, that's all for this video. I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.